Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the TF Podcast, where we discuss technology, business, and finance, and sometimes that revolves around blockchain and cryptocurrency. I'm really excited for my guest today. His name is Mason Borda. He is the CEO and founder of TokenSoft, and uh, they're working right now to launch uh, the first IPO uh, with the blockchain. So I'm excited to kind of learn more about that. And uh, with that, Mason, if you could uh, introduce yourself to everybody, that'd be fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, so my name, is, my name is Mason, the CEO of uh, TokenSoft, and uh, we're a uh, blockchain infrastructure provider that focuses on securities. Um, so for companies and funds that are looking to uh, issue security tokens, we provide the infrastructure that lets them uh, fundraise uh, for a new company or a fund. Um, right now, uh, INX is using us to do an IPO. And uh, you can also use our technology to issue and manage your securities on the blockchain. So uh, we have a set of uh, smart contracts that make this possible and a, uh, a dashboard that helps you uh, issue and, and manage the compliance around your security. Um, and then uh, we do have some infrastructure as well for uh, sort of secondary market trading uh, that we provide to uh, issuers as well. Yeah. I love to just kind of differentiate there too, because, you know, often we hear blockchain, crypto, ICO, right? Initial coin offering. That's not what you're doing here. You're doing an IPO, right? And so, um, you know, I love kind of where did, um, where did that kind of thought come through? It was like, Hey, like, let's not do this, the coin offering thing. Let's actually do a regulated security, you know, offering um, the way it's done essentially on wall street. Uh, but using the blockchain. Yeah, so uh, I, I've been in the blockchain space since uh, late 2013, and uh, up until 2017, it was about uh, infrastructure providers trying to figure out the money transmission laws or trying to figure out how to build infrastructure around uh, holding and helping people buy and sell Bitcoin. Um, and so it's it, so all that infrastructure was built around, you know, how do we help service uh, digital currencies? Uh, and uh, those are very centralized institutions. If you look at the exchanges, uh, it's sort of an all-in-one package where it's compliance up front, exchange in the middle, and custody in the back. Uh, and in the summer of 2017, we saw the uh, securities regulators in the U.S., the SEC, um, start to provide a little bit of guidance uh, as to what was a security on the blockchain, what wasn't. And uh, that week, uh, I decided to uh, start TokenSoft. And, oh, wow. uh, and the reason being that uh, there, there was, I sort of saw this opening where there needed to be infrastructure uh, for securities on the blockchain. And, and from my perspective as a, as a, uh, as a developer, um, the technology always maps into the regulations. And so that's why those cryptocurrency exchanges are very centralized. Um, in, the, in the world of securities, the regulations are a lot more fragmented. Um, just to take one security market uh, publicly, there's a lot of different entities that need to come together to make that happen. And there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle. There's a lot of different licenses you need to help, help do that. And so uh, I sort of saw a little bit of an opening to build purpose-built infrastructure for securities uh, just because the technology would just map differently and manifest differently. And that, I thought that would give us a moat. Um, and so, yeah, here we are uh, three years later, uh, and we launched actually um, two publicly registered tokens. Um, so one was for the ARCA U.S. Treasury Fund, um, and that was about a month ago, uh, also SEC registered. Um, and uh, this past week uh, with INX, uh, the first blockchain IPO, this one structured as an F1 offering. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're just really excited to finally see this happen. Yeah, I, I think it's super interesting. Um, can you kind of differentiate for those of us that you know might have experienced ICOs or, or maybe be even be afraid of ICOs and so forth? Like, what's the main difference here as to um, you know? Because I'm assuming there's probably even some people listening here and they're still hearing IPO, but they're hearing token, and so they're like, "Well, wait a second how how could this actually work that way?" What what would you say the difference is between a blockchain IPO and um, you know running an ICO. Yeah, so um, in I believe it was August of 20, uh, 2015, 
Um, I was working at a company called BitGo and uh, I was tasked with set, helping set up the wallet for, for one of these companies that came in. And uh, basically what they were doing was uh, they needed a Bitcoin wallet so they could uh, take some money in. And what they were giving in exchange for that was a token. And that was the first uh, ISO on Ethereum. Um, and those are those are largely just open crowd sales. Um, there's not necessarily any any compliance procedures or adherence to any regulatory structure. Um, and that, that was that was common back then. Um, so it started in uh, I believe 2014 or 2015 was when we started to see these things where people would put a Bitcoin address on a uh, forum post and tell people what they were doing, and people would put in money if they wanted to see the project come to fruition. And uh, this manifested through 2016, 2017 into companies uh, putting up a website announcing what project they wanted to do. And uh, people would go and fund it. And in exchange, there'd be a token that provides access to their network. Um, again, there's, there's usually, there was usually no regulatory structure for these. And those were, those were ICOs where it's, you're just openly taking money in uh, from investors online. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, the, the securities regulations basically provide a wrapper. If you think of that as just a technology, uh, a, a new technological innovation where you can easily take money online and you give back a asset that represents ownership in something or rights to something, um, the security tokens are just that technology with a securities regulation wrapper around it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a bunch of rules that we have to follow. And uh, all of these are sort of outlined in the uh, in the ARCA perspective, uh, prospectus, as well as the INX prospectus, you can sort of read all of these rules uh, that they had to follow to be able to uh, get SEC approval to go to market with these assets. Yeah, because, you know, after the ICO craze, what, in 2017, maybe early 2018, and people were finally like, okay, wait, don't do that. Then like, hey, let's do these um, security tokens or like these security token offerings. So there's, you know, a bunch of people popped up saying like, let's do security token offer offerings but um, it seemed like they were still doing it based off of like ICO type rules, right? As opposed to like, you know, all the stuff that you're talking about, actually like the digital wrapper around, basically you're putting digital wrapper around paper, right? Like, and so, yeah, yeah I think that's super, uh, super interesting. makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, with, with INX, for example, you know, um, and, and maybe even just using them as an example, or as you're talking to companies who might be thinking about doing um, something similar, what's kind of uh, the, um, I don't want to say sales pitch, but what's kind of the, what's the, how do you differentiate and say like, hey, like the reason why you want to use, you know, this as an offering as opposed to a standard IPO or as, I don't know, a uh, small market cap you know, IPO or even a crowd fund or those sort of things. What are kind of like the, the reasons why someone would go this path uh, as opposed to some of the other paths? Yeah, so um, I, I think it's still it's still really early for security tokens. So we're still building up all the infrastructure. So all the features that come and, and benefits that come with the normal IPO um, are still not necessarily there on the blockchains because we're still building up that infrastructure. Um, one element that we're noticing that our customers are taking advantage of is just the global accessibility. Um, so our, just because our customers always wanted to have a global reach, um, our platform was structured to adhere to global securities laws or global compliance requirements. Um, and so definitely, you know, one feature of this is just uh, broader participation by more people around the world and more types of people around the world, regardless of uh, sort of uh, wealth or status or uh, you know, you, you don't basically, one, one major theme I'm noticing is you don't have to be a bank to participate in these types of sales, yeah. uh, which are commonly, um, just participated in by, you know, investment banks. Um, and I think the other, the other factor that, uh, I'm sort of seeing is, um, step one is to purchase the security. Uh, step two is you have to be able to buy and sell it. That's a standard feature in, in the, uh, exchanges today. Um, and so that's another factor that's sort of interesting is um, because this is tracked on the blockchain, uh, these can be more liquid because uh, we can embed the compliance requirements uh, into the smart contract. Um, and so if, if a transfer is not valid, it will just be prevented. Um, otherwise, you can interact with all kinds of people around the world 
um, and uh, and have that sort of accessibility. It doesn't ex- exist in centralized exchanges today. Sure. And then, so what does secondary market activity look like? Is are these so like in the INX situation? Is this uh, a token that lives on, you know, that has like would be um, on different exchanges? Is this something more that would be like in a traditional? I don't know. I could go to my E Trade and 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 find these these uh, shares. How does that work? Yeah, so um, I, I don't know the details specifically around INX. Um, I, I don't know if there are even any plans for that right now or that have been announced. Um, and so uh, the perspectives is definitely a good place to look for that type of information. Um, otherwise, uh, one thing that's sort of interesting is uh, these tokens are now trading on a shared ledger and, um, and is publicly accessible. So service providers around the world that want to uh, provide access to these assets can sort of opt into doing that. And that's not necessarily a feature of uh, centralized exchanges. Uh, when you go list somewhere, you, you sort of just sit on, on that exchange. Um, but uh, with, with these assets on the blockchain, uh, any exchange out there can sort of read our API docs and integrate these um, overnight. And so I think that's definitely one thing that's interesting is uh, this is sort of a opt-in environment now uh, for people that want to uh, integrate these assets. And you've sort of seen that with the custody providers so far. So uh, BitGo, Anchorage uh, have integrated uh, uh, these tokens. Um, but for the exchanges, I think that might be further downstream. Um, and once these uh, tokens are actually um, subscribed to and, and distributed out there, then you'll probably see a little bit more activity on exchanges. But Right now, they're they're not necessarily on exchanges uh, yet, just because it's still early. Sure, sure. Um, no, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's it makes a lot of sense, and you know, I'm wondering is the path in you know for token software is a path in this industry, I guess, that you know we start seeing quote unquote traditional companies start thinking about um, security token offerings, it, like you know companies that aren't in the crypto space to begin with, but just as a way of offering more liquidity? Do you, do you see that path in some future? Um, I think it's going to be a lot of experimentation at first. Um, so I think we're sort of at the stage where we're trying to figure out, okay, what's what's really amazing about doing a, a security token? Um, and so one element that, that you'll see in the, in the INX uh, website is they sort of describe the token as a different asset class. Um, and, and that token is uh, supposed to provide uh, 40% of the cash flows uh, of the company to investors uh, based on the uh, material that's available there. And um, I think that's definitely a new concept and just the concept that uh, you can have a token that maybe gives you access to certain features in an application or a service or uh, that gives you um, some sort of discount on services is, is still relatively new because uh, we never had like a security that we could that was portable that we could move from one wallet to another one service to another service um, and where uh, cash flows could theoretically be sent directly to our accounts right it doesn't necessarily have to go through a bank you can sort of show up in your wallet instantly um, and so I think uh, there's probably you know 10 to 15 more of these little quirks that we're going to find are interesting and valuable over the next uh, two years. And I think um, as awareness of these types of assets sort of uh, increases, um, I do think that more and more people will try to adopt it just because it's, it's new, it's different. We don't know what's super valuable about it yet. Hopefully INX will show us um, and, uh, and we'll see a lot more of these on, on the, on the blockchain. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Now, um, with something like this, um, do, do the same rules apply that we hear in crypto often, you know, like not your keys, not your wallet, you know, if, if you were, um, <clears throat> excuse me, if you were storing uh, these tokens on a wallet and, you know, you lost your keys, are they, are they gone forever? <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, and that's something that, uh, that, that was actually a question we also got from the, from the SEC that we had to uh, sort of package a solution for. And um, so, so, we, so for the tokens that we put out there, we use a standard called ERC-1404. Um, and it's called the Simple Restricted Token Standard. And it has a, it has a set of features. 
And so uh, the, the main feature of the standard is that um, you can now uh, have different uh, lists of, of token holders and you can basically prevent transfers from one person to another person if it's unauthorized or if it's not a legal transaction. Um, and so that's sort of the base feature of, of our tokens. And then we've layered a bunch of other features on top of it. And so uh, the ability to uh, uh, freeze the token, I'll explain why. The ability to freeze the token, uh, the ability to revoke a token and reassign it somewhere else. And so as we were trying to uh, put these tokens out there in the world and make sure they follow the securities laws, um, it, it turned out that we needed a regulatory structure around this token as well for, for companies like INX that are SEC registered. Sure. And so uh, we have set up a transfer agent. And so the transfer agent is a service that uh, you, you as an investor can go to um, if you lose your wallet. Um, and if you lose your wallet, you go to the token soft transfer agent, uh, you contact them and you say, I lost my wallet. And there's a procedure around getting your tokens into a new wallet that involves those features, the ability to freeze a token so you can investigate. Uh, the ability to revoke a token so you can take it out of their old wallet and then reassign it to their new one. And so that was sort of a key piece of functionality that we had to figure out uh, just to make all of this possible. Yeah, yeah, super interesting. Um, you know, I want to move the conversation more to the founder side of things, right? So, um, you know, as I'm sure you experience very much, uh, you know, being in crypto and blockchain, even as recently as a year ago, was a lot different than it is right this second, you know, today, right? It seems like there's more favorability now than there ever has been. But when I'm assuming when you're getting started and you're ta talking to people or, you know, investors or so forth, and you're telling me what you're doing, I'm assuming you probably experienced quite a bit of resistance. I, you know, I'd love to kind of understand how, how that went for you. are laughing, so I'm assuming that's true. <laughs> how, how was that? And, you know, like when you come up with this idea and, um, you know, what would you kind of do? What was that path? Yeah, so uh, the first line of code at Tokensoft uh, was uh, July 24th, and uh, we launched our first two customers on September 9th. And um, actually, we, we didn't start the company off uh, by fundraising. We, we actually started off by just picking up customers and nice. generating when, revenue. When, when was this? You said July, July of when? So July 24th was first line of code. Uh, incorporation was September 6th. And then first two customers were uh, launched on the same day on September 9th, which- Sorry, but what, never what year though, sorry? 2017. 2017, okay, cool. Yeah, wow, nice. And so you basically funded by customers, that's awesome. Yeah, so uh, we got about a year in, um, and uh, that's when uh, so I, I wanted to fundraise around December through, through April and it was just, we we're just so busy with like sales that it was sort of hard. It's, it's, I think it's impossible to focus on sales and, and fundraising at the same time. Um, so, uh, we kicked that off and then it sort of uh, fell out of focus and then we closed around, uh, July of 2018, uh, for $4 million, uh, led by base 10 and eVentures. Uh, and then we also had participation by Coinbase and Fidelity. Um, so uh, at that point, it was like the investors came to us. I, I, at that point, I wasn't actually, I didn't have fundraising on my mind anymore. Because you, um, you had the sales that, you know, people were starting to recognize you basically, right? Yeah. And um, yeah, we started to develop a reputation. Um, I think we've always been good at, at actually delivering and, and getting the job done. And so that, that word sort of got around. So as investors were poking around the uh, security token space, that, that was something that came to light and sort of led them, led them to us. Nice, nice. But, and, and so you said you were, you know, you, you were initially started looking at fundraising, you know, in that December period. Did you talk to traditional investors at first or were you always focused on like blockchain and crypto investors? How did they see it? Yeah. You know, back yeah. then to like, what was that? What's the difference, right? So when you were first thinking about it to like when they started to, you know, knock on your door, what what what, what was that juxtaposition like? So my, my network was always just in the crypto space. So all of the like crypto investors and angel investors I, I, I knew. Um, and uh, one very common piece of uh, pushback was, uh, 
oh, uh, you're making you're making these security tokens. Why why would you why would you do that? Everyone wants utility tokens. Why don't you go figure that out? <laughs> nice. And um, in my perspective, like this uh, blockchain technology always arcs from uh, new technology technological innovation that people are just playing around with and sort of matures into products. And now that their products are servicing people, now they have to be regulated. And so we sort of just made an early bet on the regulatory side of things um, and just went down that path. Um, and then into summer of 2018, um, I think we maybe 15 to 20% of the investors that we spoke with were traditional. Um, I didn't poke around too much. Um, but I think from their perspective, uh, they saw a giant uh, ball of blockchain stuff and uh, they were just looking at, you know, which companies everyone was talking about to, to you know, invest in. Um, and so, you know, some people were barely figuring it out, but like most people didn't know why the regulatory side was necessary. Uh, yeah. They saw it more as a, uh, a detriment to, to the space. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we, we saw that with like exchanges as well, right? Early on, a lot of them were unregulated. They had to regulate over time. Um, and then 2018, um, I got a uh, cold email. Uh, I think it was on a Saturday at 11 uh, from uh, TJ at, at Base 10. Uh, and I think it was, it was very short. I looked them up. Uh, they were still early, so there wasn't too much on the website. Um, and so I was like, yeah, can you come to the office at four o'clock? And hmm. so come to the office, uh, that evening and uh, on a Saturday and, uh, we just got along really well. And, uh, he was really interested in what we were doing and, and how we were thinking about things. And, uh, just, uh, spoke with a lot of folks in the space, just, uh, enjoyed hearing about our reputation as well. And, um, then it just went from there. And, um, we, we had a lot of investors that, that had committed early on just from conversations I had. Um, but yeah, base, base 10 ventures ended up leading uh, that round. Nice. Nice. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I always love to talk to uh, crypto founders about the fundraising just because, you know, fundraising for any company uh, is usually pretty difficult. Um, you know, then fundraising for crypto, there's usually some interesting uh, <laughs> stories there. Um, you know, so kind of going along to, um, you know, what's happening right now in the world, uh, in the finance world, right? So crypto, for the most part, like we talked about a moment ago, it's it's the thought on it is a lot more positive than it probably has been in a while, you know, Bitcoin in particular and, and so forth. And so, um, you know, the fact that you're also working on IPOs and we see the stock market, you know, just rocket shipping, everything seems to be rocket shipping right now. Um, even though the economy is in this weird position because of, you know, coronavirus and all this kind of stuff, just what are your just overall thoughts on, on the market and what's happening and, um, you know, what that means for some of these companies that might be thinking about, you know, IPOing and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, I think the, uh, stock market has, uh, consistently performed, uh, since it feels like, uh, I think, I think since April or May, I don't follow it too closely. Um, but I, I do think that the, uh, the, the Fed does have a big role uh, in that. And that's, that's something I, uh, I'm not a big fan of. So I'm hoping that uh, this IPO and all these assets being on the blockchain sort of, uh, sort of turns the tide um, from the, this traditional financial infrastructure, which uh, can be affected and, and, and tampered with. Um, into more trusted and transparent infrastructure on the blockchain. Um, so I, I, that's sort of my hope is that, um, you know, the people growing up today that are looking at the traditional stock market, they're looking at the crypto markets, they do see uh, the, the blockchain markets as a higher integrity alternative um, to participate and hopefully a more, more interesting. Um, you know, it's one where you can get your hands dirty, you can develop your own applications on top of it. Uh, it's one where, you know, you can uh, transact with people around the world that you've never met before. And so I'm hoping this is sort of the beginning of a migration um, from traditional Wall Street on, onto the blockchain. Yeah, that could be, um, I, I think there, there's definitely, definitely something there, uh, you know, on that side uh, uh, of things. And, um, you know, it's, 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 you start seeing like these big company, you know, I think it was Fidelity earlier this week, just launched a, a, a fund. 
um, I can't remember the name of the company off the top of my head right now, but that company that just put like, I think they bought $250 million worth of Bitcoin. Um, what was it, what's that company called? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, what's it called? I'm filming. I'll put it in the show. Yeah, it was, it was like a micro something. Micro something, yeah. Um, you know, Paul Tudor Jones. I mean, like, yeah, it's it's definitely, uh, you know, getting getting more and, and more. Yes. So, so th I think there's a there's a conglomerate of things that are happening. So uh, one is that, you know, the uh, institutional space has finally come around to Bitcoin. Um, in 2015, uh, when Bitcoin was starting to get more and more popular, more talked about, uh, all the all the banks out there tried making their own private blockchains to compete with Bitcoin. Um, and, and that didn't work. Um, and uh, at the same time, you're seeing uh, the crypto space understand regulations better. Um, so you're seeing more formal institutions service the crypto market from the OTC side, from the fund side, investment side. And you're seeing um, on, on, on you're seeing CME try to participate, back try to participate. Everyone's trying to have a Bitcoin play now. And uh, on the other side of things, um, you have the uh, DeFi stuff happening. And so this is probably the fastest um, iteration of technology that has ever existed in any vertical. Um, mm -hmm. There's almost a few DeFi apps that are, that are popping up uh, every day and they're, they're all uh, very intricate from a technological perspective, they're very intellectual. Um, with, with ICOs, yeah, there was a lot of movement, but it wasn't very intellectual. People were just putting up an address, receiving money and sending out a token. Uh, so very, very simple to do. But now with this uh, DeFi yield farming stuff, it, there's just these very complex applications that are being created where there's the ability to generate revenue by making a few hops that you have to figure out by studying uh, the code for a day. And, um, and so I think uh, this is another thing that's happening that's going to push the space really quickly. So I think the um, sort of the institutional acceptance is interesting. And I think just the pace of iteration innovation uh, is really interesting because I, I personally believe uh, the faster you can iterate on technology, the more likely you're able to come up with successes. And so the faster that an industry can move, the more likely it's going to be successful. Yeah, definitely. Right. Like the, the more people, um, you know, fighting to solve the same problem, even the competition, like all that kind of stuff. I totally agree. I mean, it's kind of like proof of work, but of, of uh, you know, working <laughs> on, um, you know, uh, things to improve the space overall, who gets there quickest. I, I totally agree. Um, and it, you know, it's pretty interesting when, when you start seeing people that weren't interested in it become more and more interested in it. And, and not just like from a, you know, friends and family standpoint, it's like literally, you know, some of the wealthiest individuals or, or big companies, you know, I, I definitely tells you there's something there. Yeah, it's, it's like, and, and uh, you know, open source technology isn't new. Like there's always technology that anyone around the world on the internet could participate in, but now we can uh, transfer something that's very fundamental to us and, and that's mm -hmm. money. And so now you can build an app and provide people the opportunity to, to make money um, or to, um, to also uh, develop on the application um, and be part of the online community. And so there's, there's a, a much stronger gravitational force, I think, around the blockchain space than there, there is definitely around traditional markets, uh, Wall Street, um, as well as, uh, you know, the open source community. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, so on that, like, do you, you uh, and we, we talked a little bit about this a little moment ago, but, um, you know, do you see more security tokens coming from like traditional companies, not necessarily as an IPO method, but either as... Um, you know, means of transacting, you know, there's, there's definitely different stable coins and those sort of things out there. But what are your kind of thoughts overall and just how either Wall Street or even retailers and brands might start thinking about uh, security tokens? Yeah, so I think, uh, so if, if you're a really large company, um, or maybe you're publicly traded, or, or you're, you have, you know, a, a fairly large reputation that you need to manage, um, the first thing you're going to be worried about if you're trying to experiment with new technology is just the regulatory side of it. Um, and so, and we sort of saw that with, with stable coins, right? Uh, it took a really long time to figure out the regulatory wrappers around stable coins. Now they're very well understood. And now these larger banks and companies are trying to experiment with, with stable coins. Um, and now with uh, security tokens, uh, the, the, the good thing about the SEC registration process is everything is public. And so now what's publicly available on Edgar, uh, if you go search for, for TokenSoft, you can see 
the uh, registered securities and basically an outline of how they did it and how they're thinking. And it basically shows that the regulatory structure has now been figured out. Um, and so I do think that now that the template is out there, it does open the door to much larger companies with a lot to lose. Um, uh, it, it does open the door for them to evaluate whether this is an option, if there's anything they can experiment with here. Um, and so I think that sort of, uh, that door is now open and I do think that we will see more and more companies poking around. In 2018, at the beginning, we saw, we did see some large companies come to us that were either publicly traded or were just, um, you know, large, uh, larger operating companies. Um, and, but back then they, they came in, they came up with a formal plan and they said, okay, we want to do this. And, uh, when it came to the finish line, they didn't feel comfortable moving forward. Um, but now that there are SEC registered uh, filings or uh, offerings out there, the filings are public. Um, now, hopefully, that comfort is there, and they can sort of move across that line. Yeah, yeah, awesome, super interesting. Well, Mason, uh, you know, it's been a great conversation. Uh, question I love to ask all my uh, guests as we close is, uh, what's a question that you have that you would like to ask our guests that they can think about as they go about their day? I would, uh, I would like them to think about whether they are uh, participating enough on crypto Twitter, uh, because uh, there's just uh, there's a lot to learn and there's a lot to uh, to keep you busy there. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about the crypto space and just interacting with folks in the space, I think that's that's a great place, uh, great place to do it. And I've, I've definitely learned a lot from poking around there. Yeah, definitely. There, there... There's always uh, interest. It, it, there's definitely entertainment and and lessons at the same time. <laughs> yeah, awesome, yep. uh, Mason. What are some good ways that people can stay in touch with you, contact you, uh, pay attention to what TokenSoft is doing? Yeah. Um, so uh, definitely go to our website and sign up for our mailing list. Um, and then uh, you can follow us on Twitter at TokenSoft Inc. That's TokenSoft I N C. Um, and then uh, my Twitter handle is Masonic underscore tweets. Uh, and you can uh, follow me on there as well and uh, listen to me complain about regulations. Nice, nice. Uh, well, Mason, thanks again for joining us. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, everybody, thank you for listening to another episode of the TF Podcast. Please make sure that you are liked and subscribed. Do us a favor and fill in those stars. It goes a long way towards making sure that people get to listen and, and see this and get comes up on their feed. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at, at JG Product or uh, TF Labs at, at TF Labs underscore. And then, of course, you can learn more and watch uh, more episodes at uh, tflabs.io. Thanks so much, and we'll see you all soon.